There was uh, a real anticipation. The actors were couldn't wait to fire those muskets. And it took about 10 days to finally get to the point where we had the battle. And uh, the, the troops were coming to us. And there was an incredible high. And firing off those, those muskets, loading those muskets, uh, the uh, nitrates in the air, as the book describes, you get high on those nitrates. And there was that kind of thing. Welcome once again to A Word on Westerns, where we are paying tribute to films made about the Civil War. Our guest right now is Lee DeBrew, who did uh, multiple episodes of Gunsmoke, but also was one of the stars in the 1974 version of The Red Badge of Courage with Richard Thomas, a great, great TV movie. And Lee, if you'd come up here and join us today. Nice to see you. Nice to be seen. Lee has done uh, several episodes of Gunsmoke. Before we talk about the Red Badge of Courage, what do you remember about, I think you did six or seven episodes of Gunsmoke. Did, uh, did your parts get bigger and better each they time? They did. They did. Uh, Bob Totten saw me do a fight scene in college, and two weeks later, I was cast uh, in an episode that had Chill Wills, and Gene Evans, and Joe Dachau at that time was the producer, the line producer, and in those days, you could do a spring show and a fall show, and they would, Cotton had a group like Ford did, and I happened to be an athlete, an actor, uh, come from the stage, come from Valley College, local here, uh, so I could ride a horse, and I could do stunts and things like that, and he liked Totten like that, and so did the producers of Gunsmoke like that. Um, and they just brought you along. The parts got bigger and bigger. Matter of fact, Jim Burns uh, wrote an episode uh, that as we were shooting, because of the chemistry that was going on with the bad guys, he made this part uh, bigger and bigger and bigger as we went along. And uh, the last one I did was uh, with... Uh, Ned Beatty, and we were playing uh, Hiders, it was called, with Sierra Bandit and Mitch Vogel. And we were, it was like during the 1876 or so, when all the buffalo herds had been decimated. And we were this scroungy group of scroungers that had picked up all of this buffalo hides and were bringing in to, uh, to sell. Yeah. That's what it was like in those days. It was great. I actually started, when I first one I did was in black and white. And then, then it graduated into color as the 70s progressed. And Bob Totten had directed the first one in black yeah, and Bob white. Yeah, Bob Totten had directed um, Marvin Chomsky, who did uh, one of them, something like the 912 to Yuma, I think it was 912 to Dodge, took place on a, on a, on a train. Uh, Marvin went on to do, uh, direct a, a whole group of Roots, which I was in also. Um, yeah, and uh, who else? Let me think. Who else was? Yeah, that was it. Totten directed a lot of them. He also, of course, directed uh, the Jim Burns uh, Sackett miniseries well, as well. I was in that as well. Yeah, He really understood what yes. a, a Western was, knew where to put the camera to make it look right. Yeah, and he also, he was, he, you know, he, he was great with details. Um, he didn't let anything slide. I, I had to ride double in the sackets on the back of a horse for about 10 days. And I wanted, you know, through ups and downs and holding on to a guy by the name of Cap. And I asked him if I could, I was, you know, had a repeating rifle, like a Winchester 73 or something like that. And I, it was very heavy, and I'm trying to keep my balance. And I asked him if I could carry a rubber gun. He said, no, you carry that. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Authentic, you were right. With the, the Red Badge of Courage, another Norman Rosemont production. Exactly. Uh, so it was a quality uh, piece. Absolutely. Did you see the John Huston version? I did, I did. But not 
close to that. I think I saw the John Houston version uh, in the in the in the theater uh, when I was uh, a youngster. Maybe this was one 1951, so that would make me in the neighborhood of 10 or 12 years old when I saw it. Gee, the nobody ever tells their age. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I saw it in Los Angeles, uh, downtown at, I think it was something like the Orpheum Theater, which before it was uh, resurrected, we used to go there all the time. Well, you know, they took that film away from Houston. It did not test well, and it was about... Oh, just a little under two hours, and they they took it. Houston left to go do, uh, I think, uh, African Queen, and they edited the only version of the Red Badge of Courage with Audie Murphy that we see. It runs 69 minutes. So the guts were taken out of that film. So your version, you, you had... Much more time. Uh, again, Norman Rosemont got the right people. Richard Thomas, what a great choice right. for him to play. Yeah, and Lee Phillips uh, is a director. Who had that, been an actor. Yes, he had been an actor. Did Peyton plays as an actor, then became a director. He started with comedies. He was also from the theater from New York. He was in Theater West right here, was one of the members, founding members, along with Charles Aidman, who played the Tattered Soldier. Uh, in the Red Badge of Courage. And one of the things I remember in my mind is a scene that was shot where the tattered man and the young, uh, the youth uh, had come together and uh, the tattered man goes staggering up the uh, railway, the uh, railroad track, and he's saying, nere die, nere die, as he's going into his death throes. It was quite captivating. Uh, and, and it stands out in my mind. First of all, Charles Aidman is, is gone, but he also was a wonderful, wonderful actor. And, uh, you know, this, is, this, this production had um, Richard Thomas to begin with as his success on uh, the Waltons. This was a big step for him, and he drew a lot of people. Uh, I heard one guest today talk about President Carter having uh, a list of films that he watched in the White House. And Red Badge of Courage, I must say, was one of them. I've had two films watched in the, uh, in the White House, and the other one was Captains and Kings, where I played Teddy Roosevelt, which was a lot of fun on that I'll one. Bet. Yeah, bet. so we had Michael uh, Brandon playing Jim Conklin. And um, in the book, in the Red Badge of Courage, Crane makes a decision as a writer to stop naming the characters as the progression of the, of the piece goes on. So Jim Conklin in the book is also Jim Conklin, but he is also the tall soldier. And in a footnote, the reason for that is that Crane felt it was important that the soldiers became universal that the death of one soldier became the death of all the soldiers. Uh, it's uh, very moving uh, what happens with Jim. There's a description in the book that is far from romantic about the deaths of these young men. And uh, Conklin's death is, uh, is significant in how he is described in the book when he goes. And that was Michael Brandon. And then Wendell Burton, plays uh, Wilson, another character that was close. They were on a, a tent together. Then we had Charles Aidman was the tattered man. We had Warren Bellinger who played the jolly soldier, which he did a wonderful, wonderful job. Again, a lot of these guys had backgrounds in theater as well. So that added some gravitas to the actor's capability of bringing the, their truth to these roles. Uh, it was pretty remarkable. Then we had uh, myself as a bearded sergeant and um, Hank Kendricks, John Henry Wilcox playing the young lieutenant, uh, just as a sideline. Uh, I had done a rookies in which uh, Lee Phillips had directed. And uh, about a year later, uh, my then wife, uh, was doing uh, a Waltons in which she had a, a dual role. And I happened to run into Lee. 
And he said he wanted to use me in this film that he was doing at the present time. And I thought, as an actor, well, that's nice, but you know, really, I've heard this before. But what happened that summer, which was the summer of 1974, a friend of mine had, I had seen that they were doing the Red Badge of Courage. And I thought, well, I'll be proactive. There must be something in there. And then I saw Lee's name. And the literary agent, Polly Connell, uh, knew Norman Rosemont and called Norman. And Norman talked to Lee and Lee brought me in and he said, well, there's not really much in here for you, but I want you in this film with me. So I go on and be in this film, which was a, a real springboard for me. I must say that, that I, I had an interview by Charles Champlin, who was uh, the uh, Times critic. Uh, we talked about the anticipation of the battle. Uh, we didn't get to the battle right away. It was, there was uh, uh, a, a real anticipation. The actors were, couldn't wait to fire those muskets. And it took about 10 days to finally get to the point where we had the battle. And uh, the, the troops were coming to us. And there was an incredible high. And firing off those, those muskets, loading those muskets, uh, the uh, nitrates in the air, as the book describes, you get high on those nitrates. And there was that kind of thing that went on with those battle scenes. One of the most uh, heartfelt moments for me uh, was when, uh, and in the book, is that we were marching to uh, a place to be posted, and there was a young Confederate soldier that everybody slowed down to take a look at. And the humanity of Crane's description was, that this boy had hid the soles of his shoes, which at death was revealed that they were worn out to his, the ball of his foot, you could see, and the, not only the ball of his foot, but his worn out socks. And in the Red Badge of Courage, there was a scene in which the mother calls back the, the youth and gives him a pair of socks and, and, and a shirt and it, it blew me away because that is, that is so rich in such, and most of these people who fought this war, as Phil said, were not fighting uh, to free the slaves or protect, you know, they were there fighting for their own homes. And these human beings that gave up their life had a romantic sense of going into battle, but the youth continued to worry about whether or not he would run. And ultimately he did, along with others, ran away as well. And his wound uh, was delivered by a Yankee soldier hitting him in the head when he was trying to find out uh, where his line, where his detachment was. And so he was not goofy with this, this wound in his head. The battle scenes were incredible, charging across the fields, uh, Richard Thomas carrying the flag. It was quite, quite, quite something, I must say. It makes me want to see the film again. I haven't seen it since it first came out. Now, Lee DeBru, of course, has played a lot of bad guys. He does live theater work a lot too, but he's played cops as well. <laughs> and one of my favorites is your cop in Chinatown. I know Polanski was real hands-on, put himself in the film too. What was he like as a director? Well, I got to tell you something. <laughs> I got away with murder on that film. In, in the script, when they cast me, I was supposed to get in a fight with Jack Nicholson inside the apartment where we found the dead body. So, of course, they shot it in reverse. They shot the climax of where the water was being drained off. And we went to overlooking San Pedro on the side of a cliff. There was a big uh, cistern and there were drips, drips, drips of water. And I laughed. I thought it was so funny that this is what this multi-million dollar film is going to be about. This is the climax. And I just gave a little <laughs> laugh because I just thought it was funny. But he allowed me to do things like, now mind you, I'm kind of in the background, kind of like this, Perry Lopez, Dick Bacallion, Jack Nicholson, and I'm upstage of these guys, right? 
So it was very hot. It was a December hot day under those lights. So I take my hat off, which I'm follically challenged. And at, <laughs> at that time I was as well, but not quite as much as this. And I was busy back there wiping the inside of my cap and my head like this, you know, and listening to what was going on up there. So <laughs> at the end of the scene, we're all going to go out, and Jack Nicholson has his bandage on his nose. So I walk by him, and I go like this. Like, keep your nose out of other people's business, and that won't happen. That was just, I had no lines. I had that laugh and no lines. So Polanski allowed me to do all of that, all of that upstage. So we get into the apartment, and I had a brainy idea, and I said to Polanski, well, listen, we're coming around. Now, this is, you know, I'm an actor. Like, I think I was, this is 1973 or 4. I had to be 33. Uh, I'd been acting for about 10 years. I was feeling pretty horsey uh, by this time because I'd done a couple of films with some big directors, and, and they were letting me get away with stuff, too. A getaway. But my choices they liked, so we, we worked it out. So I said to Polanski, I said, listen, wouldn't it be just cool if we, uh, like, surrounded this thing? And I flash my flashlight in his eyes, and it flares in the camera, so I'm directing the film now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving Polanski <laughs> choices to make. And he looked at me, you know, and said, no, just laugh, and I'll give Bacallion and Perry Lopez the flashlight in the bathroom. So here's the girl. On the, Diana Ladd, on the floor, and Bacallion and, and Perry Lopez are in the, uh, in the bathroom. And so sure enough, when the door, Nicholson opens the bathroom door, the light comes and hits them, hits him, and they come out and we do the scene. Well, now I'm not going to fight. He, Polanski says, uh, Bacallion is more his size. So Bacallion and he will have this struggle. But he wanted that laugh. So I said, <laughs> like that. He says, yes. And I have a picture that a friend of mine took off off of the uh, internet of that particular scene. And Nicholson has given me such a look over that laugh <laughs> and this. So he allowed it to happen. It also wound up uh, in Mad Comic Book. A friend of mine called me and said, you know, you're in Mad Comic Book. I said, what are you talking about? I'm in Mad. He says, I did a thing called China Clown. <laughs> <laughs> really? He says, yeah, there's a caricature of you in that scene. So I, I went out, of course, ran out and got it. And uh, sure enough, even the little scar under my lip was there. So uh, that, that's my story about Polanski. He, he liked what I did, <laughs> apparently. And uh, it, was, it was a great experience.